Chapter 6, it came to pass when man began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took unto them wise of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit will not always strive with man in that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. So we're coming now to a time in which God is going to drastically alter man's lifespan. By the time they were getting 900 years old, they were getting so wicked. God says, I'm not going to leave them around that long. Cut them down to 120 years. So a drastic altering after the flood of man's lifespan, which could easily be explained by the loss of the protective blanket around the earth, allowing much greater cosmic radiation, which causes the mutations of the cells, which causes the aging process in man. There's no way by which you can protect yourself from these little neutrinos, these little cosmic rays that bombard the earth and pass right through the thing like it wasn't even there. The earth is under this constant bombardment. Actually, we are protected much by our atmosphere. There is a certain danger to too much high altitude flying. You get up above the protective blanket and your ultraviolet ray Radiation gets much greater and that the airlines have found that they can only, you know, say pilots really have it made, you know, and they only fly once a week or all. That's because of the fact that it is a hazardous thing. You're getting up above much of our protective blanket when you get up 38, 39,000 feet. Uh, and so they, they limit their exposure. We're learning more and more about that. Who are the sons of God? Now, there are those who will make the sons of God the descendants of Shem. So they are Shemites, say some. The daughters of men were the Cainites, the descendants of Cain, according to the theory. And that the godly line of Shem began to intermarry with the ungodly line of Cain. And the product is hard to explain how it was giants. But that's the theory. The term sons of God in the Old Testament is used elsewhere, but only of angels, never of man. In Job, the sons of God were presenting themselves to God and Satan also came with them. Angels. It would appear that these are angels here in Genesis. That they actually began to intermingle and intermarry. You say, but wait a minute. Jesus said the angels neither marry nor are given in marriage in heaven. That is true. But Jesus did not say that they were sexless. He just said there was no marriage nor given in marriage and it is interesting that always angels are referred to in a masculine form. There are difficulties with this verse if you try to make it the godly line of Seth and the ungodly line of Cain. There are also difficulties if you try to make it angels intermarrying with man. But in verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Some kind of a super race of giant men as a result of this. 
In the New Testament, we read that those angels which kept not their first estate are reserved in the chains of Tartarus awaiting the day of judgment. It seems that there were certain angels perhaps that did not keep the first principle or first estate. Maybe they were these angels who came down and began to intermingle and intermarry with men. There are a lot of interesting things that we don't know all of the answers to, this being one of them. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and the eyes and that every imagination and the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Now, whenever we get to this statement that it repented God, we find that it is again a difficult statement to handle because the Scripture clearly teaches that God is not a man that He should repent or that He should lie nor the Son of Man that He should repent. In other words, God being omniscient knew from the beginning what was going to be. Then what does the Scripture mean? It repented God. And God said, I, I, you know, I'm sorry that I've made man. That it repented God that He had made man. It is extremely difficult to talk about God in human terms because we are limited to human terminology. Therefore, there are certain actions of God that I must describe, but how am I going to describe them except with language that we understand? So, this is one of those areas where you run into the difficulty because you're trying to explain an action of God, but the only words that you have to explain that action are words that are significant to man, but not at all in the category of God. So trying to explain it in a way that man would understand from the human level, this action of God, I am bound to the human terms. And thus I attribute unto God a human capacity, though in reality the repentance of God is not at all as I would repent or I would be sorry for a thing. But I cannot understand the action of God because His ways are above my ways and beyond my finding out. So, God knew from the beginning all things. God knew that men would be corrupted. God knew that there would be violence. God knew that men would, would bring self-destruction upon Himself. And so, we describe the action of God in human terms. But yet, the Scripture declares that God is not a man that he should lie, nor the Son of Man, that he should repent. But I have no other word to describe the action of God, so I describe it in human terms, though it is not at all repentance as man would turn or man would change. God said, Behold, I am the Lord God, I change not. He doesn't have to change, he is God. And so God declares His destruction of the earth. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and Noah walked with God. 
in the midst of an evil and corrupt world with the wickedness and the corruption and every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart evil continually, there's one man down on earth walking in harmony with God, in fellowship with God. Noah walked with God. What a testimony and what a witness. The earth also was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. God looked upon the earth. Behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark. And thou shalt pitch it or cover it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. Now a cubit is about 18 inches long, which means that this ark was 450 feet long, 150 feet wide, and 45 feet tall. It was to be three stories, 15 feet each. Pretty big boat, really. It has a cubic footage of about 1,400,000 cubic feet. Equivalent to about 522 cattle cars of a train. So if you had a train with 522 cattle cars, you could carry quite a few animals. The ark was no just little boat. It was something like man had never seen up to that point. It is interesting that it is six times as long as it is wide, which, of course, we have discovered today is the ideal ratio for a ship, its length to its width. And most of our Navy ships are just about the same ratio, about six times to our 450 by 75, about six to one. Now, a lot of times people have difficulty with this story of the flood, the story of the ark, the story of the animals coming in, the story of the preservation of man and animals. But there have been some excellent books written on the subject. Dr. Whitcomb and Dr. Morris have combined together in a book called The Genesis Flood, which is perhaps one of the most scholarly of all of the books that have been written on the subject. But there has been of late recent interest in the flood and, and in the ark because there are continuing reports of a large ship up encased in the ice on Mount Everett. And these go back to the time of Marco Polo who reports this great boat up there in the ice as the people in the area talk about it. In 1917, there was a report of a Russian flyer who spotted in a particularly uh, hot summer and long summer as he was flying in the area of Mount Ararat, he spotted this great uh, boat down there in the ice. According to his story, an expedition was formed. And at the time that they were coming out with the evidence was when the Bolshevik revolution took over and all of the evidence was destroyed. This flyer later came to Canada and told his story, which caused others to try to find or locate this boat and one of these being a French explorer by the name of Navarro who has brought back wood from this object that he found high above the timberline 
encased in the ice and described it in his book, Noah's Ark, I Touched It by Francis Navarro. There are attempts at expeditions now, but the Turkish government being Muslim controlled has really not allowed any recent kind of expeditions. There are men of science who would like to go up and settle the issue once and for all, but the Turkish government right now is opposed to it, even as the government of Syria has been reluctant to allow any more excavations where they found the Ebla tablets because of the Ebla tablets proving the fact that Abraham did exist, David did exist, and so forth. And they're upset with this because it does give to the Israelis a claim and a right to the land. And so the Syrian government has asked them uh, not to do any more excavations in the area of the Ebla tablets and are cutting off any further scientific expeditions there uh, because of the adverse uh, effect uh, upon it, also a Muslim state. And uh, if the ark could be discovered, then of course it would uh, create an interesting problem for the scientist is how did that boat get up there so high? Uh, how did they carry the lumber up there to build that thing and, and the whole thing? Uh, it would be, of course, very interesting. Jesus said, blessed are they who see and believe. More blessed are they who believe without seeing. And uh, if it would take the ark's discovery to make a believer out of you, I feel sorry for you. But I hope that they will discover it so you will become a believer. Uh, but uh, there is other interesting evidence that the world did experience a worldwide flood. Of course, the idea of a worldwide flood is opposed to the uniformitarian theory upon which evolution is based. And it is interesting that scientists <coughs> are not always honest. In fact, there's a lot of dishonesty in the scientific field. They like to come off as men of science. But most of them have certain theories that they have sworn by and thus to change would be to discredit themselves and their pride won't allow them to do it. And anyone who says anything other than what they have already accepted as fact, any evidence that is brought forth that would destroy one of their theories that they accept as scientific fact, they immediately reject, crucify the individual, reject his works. Uh, Emmanuel Vilikovsky first came out with his book, uh, Ages or Worlds in Collision, and it was first published by Macmillan. Now, Macmillan publishes a lot of school textbooks. And the professors <coughs> were so angry at the facts that Emmanuel Vilikovsky came out with in his book, Worlds in Collision, showing the impossibility of uniformitarianism, disproving it, that they raised such a ruckus that Macmillan Company had to quit publishing the book. And Doubleday picked up the rights and began to publish it. But they were determined to not allow the book to come to the public. And when it was delivered to the public, there was a great furor and a quick retraction of the things that he said before the book was ever published, before people had full copies of the book, they were already writing rebuttals, not even knowing for sure what he said. 
Scientists are not dishonest. I mean, they are not honest. When it comes to a, a, uh, a, a destroying of one of their pet little theories, uh, they will lie, they will uh, connive and everything else in order to keep their theory alive. And their pet theory is that man exists by an evolutionary process. And the reason why they love that theory so much is because it is able to exclude God from the system and anxious to exclude God from their system. They tenaciously, religiously hold to the evolutionary theory, though much evidence is being uncovered that would really make the theory quite incredible. Emmanuel Vilikovsky has written a new book, Earth in Upheaval. Now, let me say this concerning Emmanuel Vilikovsky. Number one, he doesn't really believe that the Bible is the Word of God. In fact, there are parts of the Bible that he completely rejects. He's not a Christian. He's a Jewish scientist. But he looks at the Bible as a history book and he takes the things that happened or that the Bible declares happens and he seeks to use them as historic facts to prove his theory which is that the planet Venus was introduced to our solar system and became fixed in its own orbit at about the time of Joshua and the long day of Joshua is explained by this near pass of the planet Venus. That the plagues in Egypt at the time of Moses are explained by an earlier pass of the planet Venus that there were several passes until it became fixed in its own orbit around the sun. There were several near misses and that there was a change in the orbital pattern of Mars and Venus and that Venus was introduced actually into our planetary solar system within the last 5,000 years causing major upheavals upon the earth. Now, that's his theory, and he seeks to prove his theory. But in so doing, he amasses a great deal of evidence. But some of this evidence that he has amassed is very interesting to me. For instance, in this book, Earth in Upheaval, he tells about the bones of whales have been found 440 feet above sea level, north of Lake Ontario. A skeleton of another whale was discovered in Vermont, more than 500 feet above sea level, and still another in Montreal, Quebec area, about 600 feet above sea level. The skeletons of, of whales. Now, people don't carry the carcass of a whale... 500 feet up the mountain and several miles from the ocean. So the question is, how did the whales get there? Now, he has his own theory of the upper, you know, the thrusting upward of, of mountain ranges and that is what he is seeking to prove in this book, Earth and Upheaval, that the mountain ranges have all been thrust upward in, in very recent history. And when you talk about recent history, you're talking about in something less than 7,000 years. But rather than the mountains being thrust upwards, what about the water being thrust upwards and covering the area and the whales swimming there until the waters receded and happened to get caught and was left floundering as the waters receded off of the face of the earth. That's just as plausible as his upward thrust theory. A little more scriptural. <laughs> he also points out that Joseph Prestwich, the professor of geology at Oxford, 1874 to 1888, 
An acknowledged authority in the quaternary glacial recent age in England was struck by a numerous phenomena, all of which led him to the belief that South of England, the South of England had been submerged to a depth of not less than a thousand feet between the glacial and post-glacial or in the recent Neolithic late stone periods. In a spasmodic movement of terrain, the coast and the land masses of southern England were submerged to such a depth that points to a thousand feet high were below sea level in England. And then they, they uh, show or they talk about how that they found these uh, cliffs in, in the various stratas, various widths, uh, and the, with the bones of animals, mammoth, hippopotamus, rhinoceros, horse, polar bear, bison, the bones are broken into innumerable fragments. No skeleton is found entire. The separate bones, in fact, have been dispersed in the most irregular manner and without any bearing to their relative position in the skeleton. Neither do they show any wear, nor have they been gnawed by beasts of prey, though they occur with the bones of hyena, wolf, bear, and lion. In other places in Devonshire uh, and uh, Pembrokeshire, in Wales, the ossiferous uh, Brescia are conglomerates of broken bones and stones in the fissures and limestones consist of angular rock fragments and broken and splintered bones with sharp fractured edges in a fresh state and in splendid condition showing no traces of gnawing. And it tells about how in, there are so many areas around the world where in caves or in cliffs and fissures they have found these bones like they have been thrown in the various animals which are actually uh, predatory to each other, but thrown in at the same time, smashed and then covered with silt. As if some, by some violent tidal wave action or force. Submerged to a thousand feet. Now, you might again use that to prove an upward thrust theory but it would also provide very interesting proof of a violent flood, which I opt for. <laughs> now he goes on to tell about a the Cumberland Cavern in Maine or in Maryland, when workmen were cutting the way for a railroad with dynamite and a steam shovel came upon a cavern or a closed fissure with a peculiar assemblage of animals. Many of the species are comparable to forms now living in the vicinity of the cave, but others are distinctly northern or boreal in their affinities, and some are related to species peculiar to the southern or lower astral region. Thus wrote J.W. Gidley and C.L. Gazen of the United States National Museum. A crocodile and taper are representative of the southern climate, a wolverine and lemming, are distinctly northern. It seemed highly improbable that they coexisted in one place. The usual assumption was made that the cave received the animal remains in a glacial and interglacial period. However, the scientist who explored the cavern for the Smithsonian Institute, as soon as it was discovered and who returned there the following years for closer investigation, J.W. Gidley contended that the animals were contemporaneous. That is, they lived at the same time. The position of the bones excluded any other explanation. This strange assemblage of fossil remains occurs hopelessly intermingled. Now, of course, the climactic dish condition prior to the flood was different around the earth. The animals could have been commingling and existing together in the same area, thrown in by the violent force of the flood, the great waters of the deep being broken and thrown in and broken, the bones broken and then covered there in the cavern with silk. Now, uh, one further thing in the book is uh, he talks about the Himalayas. Scientists of the 19th century were dismayed to find that as high as they climbed in the Himalayas, the rocks of the massifs yielded skeletons of marine animals, fish that swim in the ocean and the shells of mollusks. This was evidence that the Himalayas had risen from beneath the sea or evidence <laughs> that the Himalayas were covered by water. 
Same thing down in South America, there in the Andean mountains and so forth. Uh, all evidence that at one time covered by water. So, God has left evidence. Men are misinterpreting quite often the evidence that God has left. But there is not one good reason to believe other than these remains were left by a great flood that these areas were indeed covered with water that covered the earth unto 15 feet above the highest mountains, just like the Scriptures declared. You might pick up this little book, Earth in Upheaval, or Earth in Upheaval by Velikovsky. It certainly destroys the theory of uniformitarianism and shows the uh, real documentation of cataclysmic uh, changes in the earth. Also, I was intrigued by his book's World in Collision, his book World in Collision too. Uh, I find it very interesting. There are many evidences of a great flood. There are some areas where the silt deposits are so thick, hundreds of feet thick, and for silt to be deposited in, in, in such a thick deposit would necessitate several thousand feet of water uh, for silt deposits that large. Now, the evolutionists seek to use the geological column as the basis of proof for the evolutionary theory. There are many problems with the use of the geological column as the basis of proof for the evolutionary theory. Not the least of being the fact that the geological columns are totally lacking in any evidence of any transition forms from one species to another. Not one single evidence of a transitional form of species which, of course, is a vital part of the evolutionary theory. But this total lack of evidence in the geological column of any trans transitory form of species caused a professor at Stanford University to come up with the hopeful monster theory to prove the change or to explain the changes of species for which the geological column is so absolutely silent. And so, according to the hopeful monster theory, the snake laid its eggs in the sand and when they hatched, the birds flew out. <laughs> he may call it the hopeful monster theory, but as far as I'm concerned, it's for the birds. Because you'd have to have two birds flying out in order that they might continue a new chain and develop a new species. The geological column is interesting. Of course, it's, it's, it's a, a, a thing that is involved in circular reasoning. For how do they age, how do they date the, the various... Uh, geological formations. They age them by the type of fossil found in it. Now, how do they age the fossils found in the various formations? The fossils are aged by the type of formation they are found in. In other words, there is no accurate way of aging. They are dated upon the assumption of the truth of the evolutionary theory that all things have evolved from a lesser form to a higher form. But there are areas where there is a total reversal of these uh, of the geological column, where some of the older columns are over the top of the new. 
for several hundred and in some places several thousand square miles. And so they've developed, of course, they never lost for uh, a, a idea or a theory.